This is uh, Enrique. Enrique's. Enrique Street. But. And it's the inside of the famous, or infamous, whichever your point of view is. set up here at number 40. Um, it was inaugurated as the International Workers at Education Club. So um, it, it, it started here in 1884 and it was here for quite a long time. It had a, it had a stage with a piano, um, it had a sort of um, place to where you could get tea, Russian style tea obviously. Um, and. Um, it was a hive of activity, not just political, but once again, cultural, you know, philosophical, artistic, all of that sort of stuff, which is all very much part of, you know, the, of the socialist and anarchist tradition. Um, and often, um, demonstrations started here that marched up to join bigger demonstrations on May Day. Once uh, a demonstration was ambushed part of the way down, uh, and, and, and they were, uh, uh, people were severely battered by the police on, on one particular May the 1st. Um, and on another occasion, um, some of the anarchist speakers were speaking up on Mile End Waste, which we'll have a look at towards the end of the speech. They came back here, the, uh, it looks like the police instigated a riot um, of local yobbos, local thugs, who attacked the building. Um, the workers who came out, um, you know, were, uh, were, were, were beaten. And guess what? The police turned up. And who do they charge? <laughs> the anarchists. The uh, anarchists. <laughs> and not the people who were attacking them. Well, well, well. Um, it, 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 one of the. It was also frequented by some of the uh, the English. Um, the, there was an organisation which is quite a broad organisation. They're all anti-parliamentary. They included people like William... Mo oh, you need to get off the pavement because there's a car coming. Mind your backs. There was um, an organisation called the Socialist League, and so people... There was famous people in it, like William Morris, famous artist. Everybody heard of William Morris? He designed... Um, he designed wallpaper amongst other things, designs, all sorts of stuff. Paint. He wrote novels as well. He wrote a um, famous novel called News From Nowhere. He, he spoke in here. And also uh, the, the famous Cockney anarchist cab man, Ted Legger, used to speak in here. Big fella with a big booming voice. He used to speak. And of course Charles Mowbray, the, uh, he, he was originally from Durham. Um, he was a tailor and he was involved in a lot of the tailor, tailor strikes. He used to speak there. Was, I mean, so all these English socialists were great friends with, uh, the, with, the, with the Jewish anarchists. Uh, so English anarchists were great friends with the Jewish anarchists. Now, one final thing. I said I, I, I didn't, you know, I, I, I usually say I don't want to mention Jack the Ripper, but this is the occasion I do. This is the scene of here was where one of his victims, Elizabeth Stride, was murdered by Jack the Ripper. And apparently, from what I've been told, this, um, this, uh, this the guy who was running the place, uh, he's an anarchist called William West, who was also from Eastern Europe, but he, he had his foot in both camps because he spoke extremely good English. So he, he worked with both the English anarchists and the Jewish anarchists. He was a sort of caretaker of this place. He came out 
and found a mutilated body in um, the courtyard of the, uh, the anarchist club. And apparently, so I've been told, he actually moved it next door because he thought that if a body was found there, they would use it to attack both the anarchist movement and the Jewish uh, population. Obviously, you know, he was tampering with evidence, but perhaps he would have done the same thing under the circumstances. It's all part of the moral, moral maze, isn't it? Um, as we go up, we'll see uh, a sign that some feminists put up there. They re, uh, re, they put their own street sign up with a sort of um, stencil, and they've renamed this street. Well, it's been renamed already, hasn't it? Are you all there? Yeah. Alright, this is Parfit Street. So, in the late 1960s, um, there was um, a second wave of squatting. The first wave, watch out behind you, the first wave ha had happened in, in Britain. It's actually busier on these, oh, he's gassing us now. Um, the first wave had happened in Britain in 1945, uh, at the end of the Second World War. People returning, you know, couldn't find housing, so they occupied all this uh, empty property. And, and it was kicked off again in, in outreach in 1969, um, where people started moving homeless families into empty properties. Um, it, it, that these properties were owned uh, by um, a clo clothing um, firm, and they were left vacant. So people moved in, in uh, 1970 it was. There was this very flamboyant local activist called Tony Mahoney, who's now dead, he died a few years ago, unfortunately. A uh, very colourful character. Um, uh, they were evicted, and um, the, the bailiffs brought in these Alsatians, big dogs, um, you know, German Shepherd dogs. And, um, but they managed to re-squat by luring the German Shepherd dogs out of the houses with piece, pieces of meat and they were able to re-squat. And, and there was another incident, and they were evicted again. So what they did was they had a mass sleeping in the street. So there was a lot of media coverage of that. And, uh, you know, it, it drew attention to the housing situation. So, um, to the north, you see that very large building there? Uh, it, it is, it, these are now yuppies. God, it's busy. We'll go up there, <laughs> away from there. Let's walk up. <laughs> Ninety-nine percent Jewish. It was, you know, in the 1880s onwards, and now it's 70-80 percent, maybe more, uh, Bangladeshi now. So, you know, reflecting the changes in the population. Right. So that was a, a tower house. It's, it was a notorious spike. What they call a spike. It's, um, a homeless hostel, and uh, it was a homeless hostel, and I was living in Myrtle Street in the in the seventies. Still then, and it, it re recently became a sort of very swish um, yuppie condominium. Um, now, in nineteen oh seven, just round the corner, well, just round the corner in another part of East London. The, the, the Congress of the Russian Social Democratic Workers' Party took place. Now, the Russian Social Democratic Workers' Party was the original party that united both factions, uh, both the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks. They were all in the same party at that one time, united as was just after the Russian Revolution. Now, there were already, already differences in the party at that time over whether you should 
have a bourgeois revolution before you had a workers' revolution, which is what the Mensheviks believed in. And the Bolsheviks said you should go through a bourgeois revolution to a workers' revolution. So the, the differences um, came out of the 1907 Congress. So Stalin and also Litvinov, another uh, leading Bolshevik, stayed in that uh, building, you know, because it was a cheap place to stay, very quiet place. Um, I think it's mentioned in, um, is it mentioned in Jack London's book, book on this, The People of the Abyss, or this, this about, you know, poverty in oh, the East Jack London. Yeah, Jack London. Um, so anyway, uh, you would have seen Stalin walking out of the doors of that place one time. Um, right, on the corner, Parfit Street and Fieldgate Street, is the London Action Resource Centre. You know, it, it, it was bought. Uh, it was actually bought as a building by people who were being active in the um, in the Reclaim the Streets movement. If you ever heard of that, the Reclaim the Streets yeah. movement. Who has yeah. it? I'll, I'll let you know. Yeah. Um, it was a, a movement that started in the nineties, um, wasn't it? Early on. And um, it involved part of it was the the the, uh, the, um, the cycling thing, which is still going on, is, is a sort of spin off from that. Yeah, exactly. But it was meant to you know you actually reclaim the streets from traffic in a political way, and they did some quite a lot of actions as well, RTS. So one of them uh, inherited a lot of money, and he, he bought with, with the proceeds from his inheritance. He bought the building. But strangely enough. Eerily enough, it was an anarchist club already. Not only an anarchist club, but an anarchist free school. The very last anarch anarchist. The very last anarchist free school in in East London. There was a whole succession of them. Yeah, free anarchist club. It was a, whole, it was a much a fancier building than the, uh, the one at Burner Street, which was made out of wood. This was actually made out of brick. And it had a real, a proper stage. And they were doing all the plays there. Um, they, they, had a, they organized a choir. They were lecturers all the time. There was a, again, there was a tea room. Where there was much slurping of black tea. Um, and there, there were all sorts of lectures and meetings. There, you know, Rudolf Rock was a spoken drink. And obviously it suffered as a result of the repercussions of Sydney Street. Rook Rocker, kiddo, who, who, who was totally opposed to the Kaiser, was interned during the second, uh, first World War. And, um, yeah, th this, that was more or less the, uh, the, the downfall of the Anarchist at the time. Um, the club closed because of the just before the war. And it did open, as I said, in uh, Fieldgate Street on a much more subdued level. But what also happened was that with the outbreak of the Russian Revolution in 1917, a lot of um, people went back to fight in the Russian Revolution, and a, a, a lot of them died in, actually in the fighting against the, um, the Tsarist forces, the white forces. Or they were actually murdered by the Bolsheviks. The ones who stayed over here, strangely enough, a lot of them decided that the Communist Party was the way forward. So a lot of them joined the Communist Party, or some of them went into the Labour Party. So the old anarchist movement was reduced to a, a rump, unfortunately. Um, there you go. Um, we're going to finish off in a minute um, at the place where Rudolf Rocker lived, the old, um, the old rather handsome Dunstan Mansions, and then we're going to call it a day. So then, if people want to go for a tea or uh, something stronger, you can do that. Right, here we are on the very fine Stepney Green, as you can see. And over here are Dunstan Houses. Now, Dunstan Houses is where Rudolf Rocker and the woman he lived with in Free Union, who, whose name was Millie Whitcock, lived. And along with them, there were many other flats that were occupied by anarchists. Um, not only that, uh, Kropotkin, who I mentioned earlier, he'd actually rented the flat here and he moved in a printing press uh, specifically designed for stuff for, uh, for publications to be printed to be sent back into the Russian Empire. So, after the revolution in 1905, um, 
and uh, you've heard of, uh, some of you might have heard of the mutiny on the battleship Potemkin, which took place in the Black Sea, when the, 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 um, the crew rose up against the officers, um, and uh, that, uh, they, uh, they spread the revolt to various other uh, ships in the fleet on the Black Sea. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, the revolt uh, fizzled out. Now, and, and a lot of the sailors had to flee. Obviously, a lot of them end up being executed. Now, one of the the, the main people in the, in the in the mutiny was the torpedo master uh, Afanasi Matushenko. Thank you. All right then. So we're going to have a cup. <laughs> Tea or something stronger. All right, we've got a final boozer.